So we read before the prayer in the book of Romans chapter four, I wanna turn your attention back to that in verse number 18, where the word says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Last week we, we, we picked up our third word in this year's theme and the study that we've been in at our academy, both on our elementary and, and middle high campuses. And we're studying this year four words, truth, love, faith, and unity. And I just felt led of the spirit to bring that teaching into our Wednesday study. And so last week we began to talk about faith. Hebrews chapter 11, if you want to turn there and, and, and leave you a bookmark in Romans 4, but Hebrews chapter number 11 defines faith for us. We don't have to wonder what, 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 what faith is or you know, use our own opinions because the word defines faith for us in Hebrews chapter 11. And, and, and there's something that is spoken here that I want us to spend this service talking about. Hebrews chapter 11, if you're there, just say amen. We'll look at it in verse number one. He says, now faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Can we just read that out loud together? Ready? Read. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It goes on to say that it is the evidence of things not seen. And what I've been sharing in our chapel services each Wednesday for the past few weeks is the power of hope. And I think that it's one that we all need to understand and, 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 and uh, uh, grasp its meaning. The word says here that faith is the substance of things hoped for. This morning in chapel, I asked our students from kindergarten all the way to our seniors to define for me what is hope. What is hope? And I had a chance to hear from our students on the lower campus and on this campus and I'm just always in awe of their answers because the gist of the answers that I got today was expectation. And that's what biblical hope is. It is expectation. It, 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 it's that desire for what's not manifested, that thing that, that, that uh, hasn't come to pass yet. I love what Romans chapter 8 says about hope. And I'll turn back over there to Romans 8. This is what Romans 8 verse 24 says about hope. It says, we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? I love what these verses say about hope because if I have it in my life, if it's tangible, if it's real, if it's present, if it's manifest, I don't have to hope for it. The hope that I have is in that thing I don't see with my natural eyes. It is, it is that thing I can't grab a hold of that I might not be able to explain or, or, or naturally describe how it will become real in my life. It's just a vision. It's just a hope. It's just an expectation, a passion, or a desire for something to come in my future. And there are many people that have such hope, and, and I, I'm one that wants to fuel hope. I was telling our students today, don't let anybody talk you out of your dream. Don't let, you, don't let anyone talk you out of your vision. If that vision is biblically based, if you've got promise in God's word to expect him to do this thing in your life, don't let anybody talk you out of it. I've had plenty of naysayers in my life that to try to talk me out of, of a dream or a vision that God has put in my life are in my heart, one of, one of those things being this ministry itself. There was a time when so many thought that I was out of touch with reality and, oh, bless you, Brother James, you got a good heart, but that's never gonna happen in Shreveport. I, you know, there are plenty of hope killers, but thank God for those people in your life that encourage your hope and, 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 and move you to dream and move you to have a vision because without hope, according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, there's really no application of faith. The, well, the word tells us in Hebrews 11, one, that, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. That hope is your image. That hope is your vision. That, that hope is your plan. It's your dream. You know, think about it like this. If you didn't know what you were going to build, if you had no idea of what, of what you were going to, to build or construct, 
you wouldn't know which store to go to for materials. Do I need to go to a craft shop? Do I need to go to a grocery store? Am I going to bake something? Do I need to go to the Home Depot? Am I going to build something? Do I need to go to, to Sherman Williams? Am I going to paint something? I mean, I need to know what it is I'm getting ready to do. What's my vision before I can pull resources? Well, Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, which means when an individual has no hope, there really isn't any use for faith because there's no place to apply faith because faith can't operate where there's no vision. Faith can't operate where there's no hope. And so if the enemy wanted to shipwreck any of our faith, all he would really have to do is make us feel hopeless. And I'm telling you right now, there are a lot of people in this world at this very moment that feel hopeless. That, 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 that just have this idea, I'm stuck in a place I can't get out of. And, and there's no way for me to get out of this situation that I'm in. And I may be talking to somebody right now that you think your situation is hopeless and that there's really no way out of this, you know, and, and, and the enemy is telling you to not dream, to not de develop a vision, to let go of your dreams that you've ever held in your past because they'll never become a reality. And I'm here to tell you what Jesus already told us in John 8, 44, and that is Satan is a liar and he is the father of lies and he would love to lie to you and tell you there's no use and there is no hope because if he can ever get you convinced that your temporary circumstance is permanent, then he will lead you to make permanent or eternal decisions over what you didn't know was only temporary, which leads me to one of my favorite quotes, never make a permanent decision over a temporary situation, and you never know how the situation you're in, how permanent it may look, but how that God could be at work in ways you don't even know and in ways you can't see to bring that hope into reality, and it's coming from a direction you weren't even looking Looking, that's the kind of God we serve because he is one that authors hope but doesn't just leave us out there with expectation and hope to play with our emotion. He is both author and finisher of our faith and the same God that gives us hope is the same God that will come through and show you why he's called you to put hope in him and not let you down. Can you say amen? That's a word right there, praise the Lord. So Romans 8 says, hope is unseen, verse 24. Hope, hope is not real to the, to the natural eye. It can't be grabbed. It's not tangible. If I had it, why would I hope for it? But then he says in verse 25 of Romans 8, but if we hope for that we see not, oh, look at there, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? because we have the, the evidence of his word. We have the confirmation of his word. We have the title deed in his word that we have the rights to expect. That's what the re remaining portion of the verse of Hebrews 11.1 1 is saying. The whole verse, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's the receipt. It's the title deed. It's his promise that tells me you can hope in this. It, you know, if, if, if I'm standing in the cold on the side of a street and, and you wonder, man, what's that guy doing out there on the side of the road? I might could explain my position if I could point to a bus stop sign that showed that there's a bus in operation that's coming to this location. And what I've read on that sign causes me to wait on the side of the road. I'm not just somebody standing around. I'm here with hope. I've, I've, I've read something that's told me I can expect something. And that thing I expect has me waiting right here. That's what happens when individuals get into the word of God and read his promise over their life. I'm not just standing on the side of the road of life. I'm here with intention. I'm here with expectation. I've read in his word what he's able to do and my neck is stretched out and I'm looking to see which way is he going to come. That's hope and that's faith added to hope. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. I want to turn our attention back here to Romans 4 again where we started. Because in Romans 4, we read about this man by the name of Abraham who was up in years when the Lord came to him and the Lord gave him a vision. 
He gave him a hope. And he had to take that hope that God gave him and he had to hope against hope. Take the hope that God was giving him and use it against the hopelessness that the world was offering him. And that's what the statement is saying when the Bible says that he hoped against hope. Watch this uh, uh, back in verse number uh, 16 or, or 17. He says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. That's what God told Abraham before he and Sarah had had their first child. He said, I've made you a father of many nations. He said that to a man who had no kids and was too old to have kids. He said, I have made thee a father of many nations. How many you know God will call a thing that be not as though it were? If only you and I would receive his word and accept what he said about us and call that thing that be not as though it were, speak it over your life. Take what he said about you and make that the profession over your own life. Stop saying what the world is saying about you. Stop saying, you know, what your own, you know, uh, anxiety say about you and, 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 and all the insecurities and all those voices speak. Line your mouth up with what God has said. God told Abraham before he ever had his first child, I've made you a father. Father of many nations. Before him, verse 17, whom he believed, so Abraham believed God, even God, who quickeneth the dead, that means brings life to dead things, like Sarah's womb, he was able to bring life to what was dead. And notice what else God will do in the latter part of this verse. Read it with me. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. When God saw darkness in Genesis, he said light, and he got light, amen? He calls the thing that be not as though it were. Now, that's God speaking over Abraham. But watch verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope, against the hopelessness that his circumstances and the world offered him, he believed in hope, watch this, that he might become the father of many nations. Read that part out loud. That he might become the father of many nations. What's he saying? He had to take the hope of the word and he had to use it against the lack of hope that the world was giving him that he might become what God had said about him. Do you know every one of us are faced with that same dilemma? Are we going to take God at his word and are we going to hope against hope that we might become what God has called us to be, that we might become the individuals that he's called us to be in this earth? That process is called hoping against hope, taking God at his word until I become that thing that he's given me hope for. It's a process and it's a process that requires faith that he might become the father of many nations. Now notice the remaining part of this verse, verse 18 according to that which was spoken. Read that part out loud. According to that which was spoken. So Abraham didn't just have some wild dream and some crazy imagination because he ate too much chicken and went to sleep that night. No, no, no. This vision and this hope that Abraham has, he didn't just pull out of the air. It's based on what God told him. God said something to Abraham that, that fueled his ability to dream and vision. And the word says that his hope that he held on to was based on that which was spoken. Church, we have to know how to get in the word of God and build hopes off God's word that are based on what he said, that, that I'm, I'm going to build my life and the expectation of my life based on what he has said. I'm going to allow his word to fuel my hope and to be the foundation of my hope. Put this verse in your notes, if you would. Psalms 130, verse 5. Psalms 130, verse 5. It says this. I wait for the Lord. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Oh, I love that right there. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. That means my expectation and my hope is based on what I have come to know of him through his word. My hopes are based on his word. My hopes are built, built from his word. That, that's where I'm getting this hope from. I'm not just pulling it out of the air. I'm getting it from the word of God. And that's what Abraham does here. God speaks to him, calls 
calls him the father of many nations, tells him uh, what, what the end will be from the beginning, calling the thing that be not as though it were. And Abraham said, you know what? I'm going to take this God at his word. I'm going to take this God at his word. And I love what Hebrews eleven six says. It says, he that cometh to God, he that cometh to God, number one, must believe that he is God. And number two, must believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And God rewarded Abraham for his faith because he took God at his word. Hallelujah. But where did that start? Because we, when we read of Abraham, as we're about to read here, the first thing that we learn of him was that, he's, that, that he was strong in faith. That, 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 or, or that, you know, that he, he was not weak in faith. That's the first thing we read in verse 19, that he was not weak in faith. And the rest of those verses are gonna speak to his faith and, and his persuasion. But what was that based on? It was based on hope. And, and, and that's why I feel like right now in our world today, the enemy is using the airways and news media and social media and negativity being spoken out of the heart of believers even and unbelievers to just suck the life out of us, to make us feel like every situation is hopeless. Why? Hopeless people never turn to faith. Hope Field people turn to faith because it is by faith that hope becomes reality, but they'll never be disciplined for faith when there is no hope. And that scripture, Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, where there is no vision, where there is no hope, the people perish. Which means when I don't have any vision for my life or I don't have any hope for my life, that's when I lose discipline. But where do I get hope? Where do I get faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's why we can get tuned in to anything, undivided attention. But when the word of God is spoken, the enemy says this is pointless, this is useless, and we turn our attention away from the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is the source of hope, and it is the source of faith. And the most important thing we can ever do on any given day is get in his word. Can you say amen? amen. Now notice here, he, he, he says that he was not weak in faith. He was not weak in faith. But what, what's fueling that? Hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is hope that leads me to faith. He says here in verse number 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Think of all the things that we consider that rob our hope. Think of it just for a minute, because all of us are challenged every day. Think of a situation that you have been in or someone you know has been in. And when you start considering that situation, it tells you there's no use, there's no hope. And that's, and that's where Abraham was before the Lord came and spoke to him. He, 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 he was considering his own body now dead. He's considering Sarah's age and that this isn't possible. This thing is unrealistic. But once God gave him his word, notice verse number 19 says, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. How many times have we allowed our considerations stop our faith? We started considering all the reasons why a word could not come to pass in our life. And when we did, it sucked the hope right out of us. Because there are plenty of people that if you don't start considering all the reasons why this won't work, they will consider it for you. I've had those voices in my life for plenty of years to tell me why the hope that God's put in my heart could never be real, and they would list all their reasons why. Consider this, Brother James. Well, consider this. Now, consider this. And, and yet, that's where Abraham was until God spoke, and he stopped considering what challenged or contradicted the Word of God. Man, that's good right there. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. See, while we're considering all the reasons the thing can't happen, God's already figured out what we're trying to work out. Amen. When he was about 100 years old, didn't even consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. 
Notice now he's not weak in faith. Notice verse 20. He's staggering not at the promise of God through unbelief. He's so uh, certain that God's word will come to pass. Notice the word says he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Giving glory to God. Even before the thing manifested, he's giving glory to God. Verse 21. And being fully persuaded. Look at, the, look at what Abraham is described as. A man not weak in faith. A man that's not considering himself. A man that staggers not at the promise of God. A man that is strong in faith and gives glory to God. Verse 21, a man that is fully persuaded. I love this. Being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he, God, was able also to perform. He said, if this God can make this promise, if he's big enough to, to speak such a word as this, he's big enough to bring that word to pass. He said, if he said it, he'll do it. He's fully persuaded. But what gave birth to a man that was not weak in faith? What led to a man who would stagger not at God's promises? What led to a man that would be strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded? Hope. Hope. That's the power of hope. That, that, that all God has to do in any one of our lives is just give us hope. And to think that each one of us every day have an opportunity to, to pour hope into somebody else. That the power of, if you can just see it, if God can just get you to dream it, if he can just get you to see it, then now with that vision, he's ready to fill your life with the resources to make that hope a reality. All it takes is hope. This is why the enemy attacks it so much. This is why, you know, for every dream and every vision that God has ever put in your heart, the enemy comes with his full assault to tell you that's useless, that's pointless, and he gives you all the things to consider on why this thing can never be real in your life. Hope is a powerful, powerful tool. Do you know Ephesians 3, verse number 20 tells us that God uses our thinking as the platform of his performance? That God will take what I think and use that as the platform of his performance. Ephesians 3.20 says that, that, that unto him, God, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. God is saying, your thoughts are where I begin to perform. So no wonder the enemy wants to reduce our thoughts. No wonder the enemy attacks our mind and tells us there's no hope and there's no use because he knows that once we lose hope and once we uh, 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 start considering all the factors in our life that are overwhelming and too big for us, it will turn our faith dial to zero and we give up, cave in and quit. There's no application of faith where there is no hope. I'm gonna say that again. There's no application of faith where there is no hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It begins the life of faith. And it's why the enemy works so hard to destroy our hope. And I, 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 I'm telling you, church, I, I feel with everything in me, I'm, I'm speaking to a generation of people into a world, into a culture where the enemy is just flooding our minds with hopelessness. That, that our circumstances are beyond God, that they're beyond help, that there's no way out of the situation that we're in, and I just want to fuel somebody's hope. So let me just tell you uh, something that happened today that led to why these four chairs are here and something we're going to do for the remainder of the service. Oftentimes at chapel, more times than not, I get into a, a dialogue with our students, especially our lower campus. I like asking them questions. I told our upper campus today, I said, I don't ask questions you know, for a right answer. Whatever your answer is, is my right answer. It helps me to know where you are, to hear your answer. And so at the upper campus today, right here in this uh, worship center, I asked the question of our students, what is hope? And they began to give me some, some, uh, some answers. And with no premeditation whatsoever, I just felt led to ask one of our seniors named Don about hope, and he came up and he shared about hope. 
And I, I asked him, was there something that he had had hope in that had become a reality? And so he spoke to that. And when he did, the Lord took something I didn't know was gonna happen and turned it into something extremely powerful. And I haven't been able to get over it all day. I, I, when I got home this evening, I, I was sharing with my wife. I said, baby, you, you just wouldn't believe how God moved in both of our chapel services today. I said, it was just supernatural. And she says, you know, you're always telling me about chapel. She said, you love chapel. I said, I love chapel. I said, but baby, today was super special. And my phone was blowing up with those that were at chapel about pastor, man, it was so powerful. And it was just, God just moved. And so all I could think was is, man, the church needs to hear, you know, and our, our live stream, our audience needs to hear what I had a chance to hear and what those that were present had a chance to hear just to really tap the power of hope. And so, man, I began to coordinate the whole thing. Can we get this together on the platform? And about 20 or 30 minutes later, Mr. Euler texts me. And I was literally on the phone with Henry coordinating this. And I get a text from Mr. Euler and it says, basically, and I'm going to paraphrase, we need to get this up on the platform. A lot of people need to hear what happened at chapel today. He doesn't even know I'm in the process of making that happen at that very moment. I said, okay, that's confirmation. And so I told him what I was planning. And he said to me, I need to get out of his head. I said, man, you get out of my head. But I have no doubts that you're going to be blessed to hear this testimony of hope and just how God will work when you think he's not moving, he's moving, and you don't even know he's moving because he's a God of all hope, and he's a God that'll move when just anybody gets one little glimmer of hope. He can do amazing things. This all started with one of our seniors here at the academy, so I'm gonna get Don to come on up to the platform. Don, if you would, come on up here, and I just wanna... Um, introduce you real quick and let you share a little bit uh, 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 of what came out today. We're going, we're going, well, I guess we're going to put you right here. Amen. And uh, man, I just, I just know the, the congregation is going to be blessed by, uh, by what you have to share. And we go ahead and take, take this as well. Somebody grab this for me. Amen. I might need it again. Keep it close, man. Keep the sword close. Amen. Don is one of our seniors here at, at, at Word of God Academy. Um, Man, today, I don't even know except the Spirit of God that prompted me. Didn't you come up to answer the question about hope that, that had you, you know, have you had a hope and had that hope become real? Is that how the conversation started? Yes, sir. And, and, and you know, you and I didn't talk before chapel because I didn't know this was going to happen. And then I did ask you this evening, would you come? And you came. So let's give it up for Don. He wasn't afraid to get up here and testify. Amen. You know, uh, there was something you said that I really feel like people need to hear. And to, they need to know, you know, a little bit of, of your backstory and how God can be at work and you don't even know he's at work because he's just that good. And uh, I, want, I, want, I, want, I just want to speak to that and, and where you were before you came. You've been at Word of God Academy now three years, came in your uh, uh, sophomore year, and, and I want to speak to that. But at the same time, you know, you and I go back three years plus, but your dad and I go back a lot of years. So, Landers, could you come on up here and, and, and join the platform? We, 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 we go back a lot. Of years. matter of fact, I want you over here with me. Yeah, if you, if you would, come hang out with me, man. Uh, uh, give it up for Landers, man. He's on, our, he's on our staff here at Word of God Academy, yes, sir. Word of God Ministries, coaches our junior varsity basketball team, and so you're all plugged in, but it wasn't always that way. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't always that way. Man, I met Landers many years ago, and he'll speak to this here in a minute. And how long have we known each other? I know it's been more than 10 years, but it, it seems like it's, I can go back further. Maybe 12, I mean a long time. I'd say about 12. About 12 years? Yeah. Okay. And I had never met his oldest, Don. I'd never met this, this, this teenage boy at the time that, that he began to talk about. And I just started, we just started having conversations every week about Don, and I had never even met Don. You could have walked in the room, and I wouldn't have known who you were. 
but the Lord was orchestrating something between uh, Landers and I that affected you, and I don't even know you. But here you are, a student at Woodlawn High School, and there was a lot going on in your life at that time. Tell us where you were at the beginning, before Word of God Academy, before all um, this. Ninth grade at Woodlawn. I didn't engage in sports, but I was in and out of school, didn't have friends much, so I just stayed to myself, and I, I came from a broken home, so it was hard for me to keep that, that hope in me and to keep going to school, so I began to like stop going, and my grades started to drop, and suddenly, like I, I passed the ninth grade, I don't know how, but I did, but I was going into my 10th grade here. To sum that up, I failed it. And over the summer, I would begin to go to one all the time when I came back with my dad, reunited, built a strong bond, and I met James, which is my best friend now, so. Let's get James up here. <laughs> Amen. All right now. <laughs> so yeah, I met him and we began to be close. I never had the thing for basketball. I never played it. But once I started to see he was good at it, I was like, oh, hey, it looks easy. So I was like, yeah, I gave it a try. And we started to fall in love with it. I started to have faith in him to keep going. And keep going then suddenly came to school here. And my grades at Woodland was like 1.1 1 .1 the GPA. And when I began to go to school here, I had a 3.0 my first year here, so. Don, you said something at chapel today that wrecked me, man. I hadn't stopped thinking about it all day. Um, you said there was a point you didn't know if you would see your senior year. Were, were you that hopeless? I mean, with, with, the, with the circumstances that you were facing, you know, at Woodlawn, don't feel like you have any friends, broken home. I mean, what, what, what was life like right there that you're thinking, man, I won't even see my senior year? Uh, I gave up. I started doubting myself, like, I'm not going to see my senior year. Like, the environment I was in, People I, I didn't hang around, but I seen like become nothing. I was like, dang, I'll probably be like one of those. Never make it in life. And I kept down myself. Like I would never see my senior year, never see my senior year. And I just stopped going to school and I was like, dang it, it might happen. So yeah. Was there was there an alternative? I mean, were there any thoughts in your mind that, you know, my alternative is this? that since I'm not gonna make my senior year, since I'm failing, I'm not gonna pass, these are the alternatives? I mean, were, 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 the, were those ideas or thoughts about the alternative where I'm gonna go, were they out there? Uh, no, sir. I, there was no plan B? No plan B for me. Wow. And what is so amazing about God is that this man uh, has been a blessing to my family since the day we, we entered each other's lives. And I don't have time tonight to talk about how much you mean to the McMinnis family and the relationship that we established at a restaurant. You know, I think I'm just here to eat on, on a Sunday and we get so knit that when you started talking about, you know, cause we, we would talk and you would share about Don and at Woodlawn and that was my alma mater. And I don't know how long I pestered you, but I know I was pestering you because I wanted you to come. Number one, I wanted you, I felt like you belonged here at Word of God. And then, you know, we were talking about, I would talk to you about Don, like, man, bring Don to the, to the, to the school, bring Don to Word of God Academy. And I know I was pestering you, and I'm, I'm, you want to speak to that? Because at one point, you were going to leave Shreveport. You wasn't running from me. No. no. <laughs> For the record. The, the, I wasn't running from you, uh, I ran to you. And, uh, and you was the first one I called. I was like, Pastor, um, 
Well, we talked before then. He was trying to get me over, and I was like, no, nah, I'm not ready yet, because it was a family thing. I've been there for 20 years, and uh, I, went, I just wasn't ready. I didn't have the vision for it. It's like, I had to tell myself, hey, if I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move in faith. And so I called you and I was like, I was feeling down. I was just feeling bad. And I called you, I said, hey, I'm finna move to Houston. I have just gotta go. I got a job lined up. I just can't stay in Shreveport. That's losing hope. Uh, and when I called you, and you was like, let's pray about it. And and let me see what I can do. Just hold up for a minute. Just give me a couple months. Just hold up. So I said, okay. So my plan was, now I had a vision that I was already with Scromile on, you know, his assistant uh, part-time while I was working at East Street. I come in what I can. And, and I was like, when I started that, I was like, man, I got a vision to coach. And, and whatever pastor come up with like a job plan, I'm, I'm going to take it because I just want to get out this life and end up in another life. And what I did, what I called you, we prayed about it. I wait on you about it. And we ran with it. And we ran with it. It's like it opened up so many doors for not just me, my son, because me and pastor was talking about it the whole time. And Don didn't know nothing about it. How long did we talk about Don being at Word of God Academy? You said earlier it was like three years. About three years. Sir. Three years. Three years. So what you don't know, because he told me today he didn't even tell you, is that three years we're talking about you coming here at Word of God Academy, and you're in a situation that you felt, because y'all weren't really connected at that time. Yeah. Y'all's yes, relationship was broken. It wasn't, y'all weren't connected. Yes, sir. And so God did a whole lot. He, he, he reconciled a father and a son. Yes, he, he puts you in a, in, a, in a new place. He brings you out of Woodlawn, plants you here, brings you into my son's life. Y'all became best friends. I mean, so much happened in just a moment, and all it took was hope. hope. Because that's where, that's where the both of you were yes, before all the change happened. There's, just, there's no, I'm, I'm going to Houston, and I'm done. And, and, and to think about, you know, where things are and where your relationship is now, all, all because of hope. Yeah. And, and, and Don, do you know how many young men right now need to hear your message, need to hear from you and see that no matter how, you know, dire a situation looks that there, you know, there is no hope, that that is an absolute lie, that God is working in ways you can't not even imagine. Don, the Lord's going to use you as a mouthpiece. I believe this is only the beginning. He is going to use you to minister to those that are broken and feel hopeless. He, he's done all this for a reason. I, I felt like God put a love for me, a, a love in, for you in me before I even knew who you were. You know, and I, I told you from, you know, from the beginning, I felt like we were connected because of Don, that there was something that God was doing through us, really because of him. I, I, I couldn't pitch it. I was like, it's somewhere, Pastor just, like, he connected to me. I just didn't know what it was, and I found it. I knew what it was, and I see it. I'm so, uh, we blessed. Oh, amen. <laughs> amen. 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 <laughs> James, you're watching ringside all this happen because you saw all the conversations we were having. We had never even met Don, and you've watched this whole thing unfold. So as a peer, a fellow student, my son, I mean, what do you say? What do you see? What's on your heart? Um, so I remember after service on Sundays, you know, we leave the third service. And you'd still have a lot of energy after the third services, so we'd go to, yeah. we'd go rolling up to yeah. East Ridge, and, um, you know, Landers would be the first person to greet us. You know, he's on the clock, and so he's supposed to be running in, in his part, and so I didn't know anything of it. I just knew he was family. Amen. So we'd come into East Ridge, you know, went, went from one year to two years to, to ten years, and we'd go in there and we'd talk about the Cowboys, about the 49ers, 
because when we first went there, he was a 49ers fan, and, you know, that changed. That changed when we went in there, he became a Cowboys, and then a couple nights ago, that changed back, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but, uh, just, yeah. But, um, man, we talk about everything. We talk about life, but I remember when the conversation got brought up of Don, and I knew nothing of Don, and... I remember I was 13 because we were the same age, and you told me that you had a 13-year-old son that was my age. We were talking about basketball, and you told me that you wanted to, that you and your son had played against each other and that you wanted to see me and him play against each other. And so I knew nothing of Don. I just knew that um, I just knew of him through basketball and through you. And so years went by, and that was, that was a couple. That was about three years later we were able to get um, – I was able to meet Don at that Olive Tav. And, you know, I'd never met him before. I just knew of him, but something felt, something felt right, like that had already been aligned way before that night and before that summer. And um, if we had the picture, I would, I would have showed it. But uh, me and him took a picture whenever, you remember that, we walked, we walked back in there where they were eating before Olive Tav and didn't know the guy, never met him, but I was just like, man, let me get my picture with you. And so, wow. sure enough, we got our picture um, that summer came, and then um, after that, that's when we brought him out to the house, and we shot basketball. Um, that's where I really got a chance to meet him, get to know him, and then one night turned into two, turned in, two turned into five, five turned into ten, and this guy that I knew nothing about has become my brother, you know, more than blood. And so Amen. God is... God is faithful through it all, and he's been faithful in what I've seen, and I have to give him credit and you credit because what he came from and what you've had to bring him through, that's not something that can just click and be completely fixed overnight. You know, God is good, but he is a God of, he is, and he is a God of seasons, and so he's going to work through this process. And so we had to remember to trust the process, and there was times when he would call me and you would call me and I'd call both of y'all and... You know, we were, we were going through it, and there was, some, there was some disputes, and I'd pray about it and get back to talking to both of y'all, and before the end of the day, y'all were telling each other that y'all loved each other. And, yeah. man, I, I've, been, I've been blessed to be a part of that, but, um, but, man, I see y'all no different than my family. And so I've been extremely blessed to, to call Don my brother and to, to battle it out on the court and um, with him for, what, three years now? Three years now, and then so much so that it went beyond school that we'd hang out and go work out in the back when nobody else would be there. We'd be out there at school, um, at the school gym, early in the mornings, and just talking, just talking about life and just connecting this bond that God had established long before I was ever even born. Amen, amen, amen. Don, what's on your heart, man? Here you are on this platform, and the Lord's using you as a testimony that's at work in you. Um, what's on your heart, man, that we hadn't heard? Um, well, right now, what's on my heart is, like, I always wanted to be a motivational speaker, and you said this is the beginning, so I want to tell everyone that's out there, like, don't give up on God. Have faith in him. <laughs> he'll make a way. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. Man, you know, church, when, and, and I speak to our members and partners abroad that when you sow into this ministry and when you show up and you pray and you pray for me and you pray for our leadership and you serve and our volunteer team and our staff, school, academy, all of you, this is what's happening that we don't always get to see behind the scenes. That God is at work in so many ways that we'd be up here every night just testifying. But Don, when I tell you that you bless me today, there are times in life and in ministry that you're reminded why you do what you do. And I want you to know that today, you reminded me why we do what we do. And I wasn't the only one that was saying that after this morning's chapel when everybody just heard your heart and how you went from this place of hopelessness to the life that you have now where you're excelling as a student. I mean, the, the, you, you can write the script 
you are not stuck in any situation. I mean, you're graduating this year and the opportunities are open for you to choose which direction do you want to go. You are not in any rut. You are not stuck in any circumstance or situation. I mean, look at the shift that's happening in your life. And God didn't just do that for any reason. You are a purpose with a name. And, 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 and man, he, he's got a, a thoughts for you and plans for you. And I'm just blessed to get to be a part of it. But if it weren't me, it would have been somebody else. I'm just so glad I got to be a part of this and that my son got to be a part of this, this history that, that's in the making and, and what God is going to do in you and what he's going to do through you. I'm going to be ringside. I said earlier today, you're like one of my own. You know, I know I keep adopting kids, not literally, but there's plenty that we have here, but you're, you're, you're definitely our, our fifth or sixth. I forget which came first, you or Jacoby, but man... You, you fueled my faith today. You bless me like you can't even begin to imagine when you just shared your heart at, at chapel. And man, to have the honor of you being at our school, your senior year, you're gonna walk across that, this platform in just a few months. You are gonna see, you have seen your senior year. You have played basketball. We're going back to the championship again. I mean, think about the, just the shift that's happened in your life. And now your dad and the two of you are up here together every day. And to think about where you were and where you are now. Only God. Only God. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm going to get Mr. Euler to come up here. He's our head of school, and man, he sees, he's watched all this unfold from a whole different perspective. We don't have you a chair, but we'll give you the center right here. And uh, man, Mr. Euler, what does this do for you when you see a guy like Don, who the whole school just loves, and who does the bobblehead moves on the court like he did last night to throw the defender off? I mean, I still got to figure out what that was, man. But I'm but, overdressed yeah, you don't up even know. here. Yeah. I'm overdressed up here. You Pastor. are overdressed, but, but you look like a head of school. <laughs> no, yeah. no. I had to change, you know, right before. Listen, here, here, here's what I was thinking when I was down there. And I actually text somebody in the congregation this. You've worked your tail off, bro. And, and um, we've been through the fire. And so what I was thinking when I was sitting down there was, You ended up here three years ago. Your GPA was non-existent. You did two years in one yeah. to get yourself so that you could just play basketball. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, the first year here, I said, you ain't playing ball, bro. Yeah. You ain't doing it. Sorry. Pastor was like, when can you play, when can you play? I'll tell you when you can play. And so you but sat you know for what? a while. That vision produced a discipline. It sure did. he got it together and made it happen. So you got it together, you made it happen. And I was looking at GPAs the other day and I literally text Mrs. Palmer and said, I think you may make it. You're gonna make it. And that's because of hard work. And so I, I, I did, I text Pastor in, in caps and said, yes, I'm yelling. But I'm just so proud of you because you saw a vision. We talk about it all the time. Your purpose was name, saw a vision and you just ran after it. And it's not over yet. You still, got, you still got more ahead of you, not only at the academy, but in life. And I agree with Pastor that, that you're a story to be told and you're a testimony. And so you got to use them for the right kingdom. Amen. And it ain't the small K, your kingdom. That's you and I talk about. Yeah. It's his kingdom. Yeah. And that's what it's after. I love you, bro. Please. Amen. 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 I'm still gonna wear you out. <laughs> stay, stay right here, overdressed. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta get one more person up here. We get coach up here real quick because he, he is, he is his coach. So we, we want to hear from a coach's standpoint of what God is doing. Amen. Y'all give it up for Stromile Swift. <laughs> I saw you crying on that front row, man. Too late to wipe your tears. <laughs> man, this was very unexpected. <laughs> Dealing with pastor, I should have expected. <laughs> and man, I, I've, I've coached this kid for the last three years. And I, I've seen where, where, he, where he's come from, the work that he's put in. 
and just the, the impact that he has on the other students here. The encouragement, you see a kid that most kids probably wouldn't associate themselves with, and he has kids following them around because they look up to him. That's the impact that, he's, that he has on, on this whole academy. Amen. Like just coming from where he comes from, like I can identify because I know the environment that he was brought up in. So just to see this kid excel and just, just use what he has right now, just the, like the people that he's surrounded with, like how it's helped him. And I, I can't even really speak to it. Like I'm just sitting down on the front row, just just kind of in tears, because I, I was like, man, I'm so proud of these two guys. Like, because I I was a part of meeting uh, Coach Landers through Pastor. Like, brought him on staff, and like I had never met Don either. But just how God works, and just just being able to see God's plan unfold, and just the relationship that him and James Christian had, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, so I, I was just telling him in the back just how proud I was of him. And whenever he starts to feel discouraged, because it's, it's not gonna always be easy, it's gonna be hard times. Like, like you guys are like really just starting to like build this bond. So it's, there are gonna be hard times through this process, but when you start to feel discouraged, man, just look back on where you came from. And man, you'll, you'll it's, it's amazing, like, because it, it encourages you, encourages you when you look back and you see where you come from. Like you're not where you used to be. You're not where you want to be, but you're not where you used to be. So, <laughs> and again, man, I, I just want to, I can't wait to, we finish off the season with the championship, but man, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing you walk across this platform and, and get that degree. Cause that's, that's what it's all about. And you know, we, we talked about, you going and playing on the next level. Like, I don't, I don't know like where that's gonna lead, but man, I, I'll do everything in my power to, to try to make that happen. So I, again, man, I'm, I'm proud of you. Right. Man, you ain't coach. <laughs> proud of y'all, man. Come on, preacher, man, you do it, man. You, you let you bring that word out. <laughs> amen, amen. Can we give it up for Jesus tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, Don, man, let's just uh, let's have a word of prayer just over you and over any individual right now that may be watching this live stream or that's here, that's in a situation where they feel like there's no hope. And I, I know there's so many people that relate, but I know God did this and he's doing this in our lives and we get a chance to partner and we get a chance to see how the Lord can take a situation where you tell me as a teenager you didn't think there was even a plan B. And to see where your life is right now, man, and just the goodness of God and how he's going to use you. Don, there are others out there you're going to reach. His story is your story, and your story is his story. And we're only in the early chapters, and I'm going to be ringside. I'm going to be right here. I can't wait to see all these chapters unfold and what God is going to do in you and through you. Because none of this just happened. He's got a divine plan. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for what you're doing in our lives and what you have done and just the testimony that we heard tonight from Don and his dad. And God, I just thank you that they're one of millions of testimonies that are a result of hope that all things are possible to them that believe and that you work in ways that goes beyond our understanding. And that even when we find ourselves in life trying to figure something out, you are so good that you've already worked it out. And I thank you for planting in this young man who was a teenager at the time, courage. Courage to step into a new school, step into new relationships, step into a new discipline, a new culture fearlessly to have courage thank you for a dad that had courage to step into something new to take you at your word to have faith thank you for a coach 
who could be at a lot of places. But followed your word and your voice to be here. To speak into these young men's lives. To take the things that he's learned and offer it to their benefit. Thank you for giving us a school where Jesus is first. And where our students love each other. And where the spirit of hate and division is broken. Where there's no racial warfare, no class warfare, no social warfare. But there's a genuine love. And we know that's not accidental. That's your hand. That's your spirit. That's forging friendships that will go far after graduation. I thank you for the friendship we heard of here tonight between James and Don. And that you'll even use that friendship to break down walls, prejudices, ideologies, narratives that aren't based on truth that are not filled with love, that are absence, absent of faith. Lord, use this ministry in a city that's broken to reach those that feel like there's no hope because you are the author of hope and all things are possible to them that believe. Father, I pray right now in this moment, if there be one person in this worship center, one person watching this live stream that's never called on the name of Jesus, that this would be the day of their salvation. There's your one young person right now watching or listening that thinks their situation is hopeless. I thank you, Father God, that today you impart hope where there was no hope and that you bring faith by the hearing of your word. For you said in your word that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I just declare in faith that individuals, young people, all people, male and female, will overcome by the testimony of this senior tonight, the testimony of this dad tonight, who himself was hopeless and thought he had to run out of this city, but you had thoughts for him that went beyond his understanding. And I thank you, Lord, today that no matter what our situations are, your thoughts for us are peace and not evil, that you have an expected end. And that when we seek you, we find you because you never leave us and you never forsake us. And you're a God that is always near. Jesus name and with every head bowed is there somebody in your life that God's called you to give hope to because I'm telling you I'm not here right now if it weren't for men and women of faith all along this journey that gave me hope when I had no hope that wouldn't let me quit I'm thinking of Pastor Sammy Thompson in Dallas, Texas, an older black pastor there that would not let me quit. I'm thinking about a Sister Rose Tucker, a member of this ministry who's been here since the start, that if I ever said I'd quit, she had showed up at my house and whooped me with my mama's permission. God has filled my life from the beginning to now with men and women who wouldn't let me quit. And I know there's someone in all of our lives that we can be that voice to and just speak hope because there's power in it. In Jesus' name, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge today that you're a God of hope and that faith is 
the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins. You raised him from the dead so that I could be forgiven. That I could walk in newness of life. That no matter what my past might look like or my present might seem like, there's always hope because of the name of Jesus and your word. So right now, I make a decision to turn from fear to faith and to keep hope alive and be a hope builder and a hope believer that my life can change for your glory and that my changed life would motivate change in others for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.